Um, <laughs> so today um, we will be hearing from Matt Bertone. He is the director of the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, which is where we submit samples for analysis. It's really awesome. Um, it like feels like science, like old school science when you go in there, which I always really like. Um, in the second half, we'll be doing um, hands-on stations again, and then we'll be doing Q&A about the project at the very end for the last half hour. Um, one thing I want to say about today's talk is that Matt is our friendly, like I like to think of him as our like insect ambassador. Um, he is, you tend to be pro-insect. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, for insect control questions, we'll wait for a later class, um, the integrated pest management class. Sometimes it's a breakdown, and if you just see him like kind of melting under the like, why, why so many death questions? <laughs> uh, insects are good. This is the class we do first, so we can convince you that you know, put down whatever you were going to use to kill them because they're really, really cool and really rad. So with that, Matt, I will turn it over to you. Great. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I will tell you how to kill something, maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely the majority of the things out there you do not need to kill, uh, especially things just flying around randomly. Uh, if they are eating your plants, yeah, you know, we'll talk, we, you can find ways to get rid of them. Uh, some are harder than others, uh, some, and some you don't want to mistake for the bad guys for the good guys and vice versa, so. Uh, okay, so I have, a, I have a talk, it's about an hour or so, I have till, I have about an hour and a half or so total, so we're going to go through casually, just feel free to interrupt if you have questions, we can elaborate on topics, uh, I'm not going to go through every single thing, and, and I'll be able to provide this, uh, uh, to you later, so don't furiously write notes or whatever, if you, unless you really want to. Um, I also have some show and tell, I'll pass around when, when the time is appropriate for, during the talk, I have some, you can actually see these things in real life, um, and then we can talk about them a little bit later too. So, hope to have plenty of time at the end for all your questions and just kind of discussions and whatnot. Um, but, to get started, um, what I'm gonna cover, so, there are lots of groups of insects and other arthropods that affect landscape plants, and this is gonna be mostly on ornamentals, although many of some of these groups will feed on kind of vegetables and food crops that people grow. Um, but because of the diversity of ornamentals, uh, there's a huge diversity of those, those types of insects or arthropods. So uh, I'll be covering the major groups, um, but uh, if you encounter something that, you're, that I don't cover now, of course, we're here to help. Uh, Ashley, I'm sure, could answer a lot of those questions too, but if you ultimately can't figure out what this weird organism is, you can always send in photos or specimens to our lab, and we, I'd be happy to help you ID what they are. So, um, so for instance, here, these are both lace bugs, but you're probably not going to see this one very often, uh, where this one is the bane of many gardeners' uh, existence. Um, so, I'm going to start off with true bugs. So, have you, you've all read the chapter, the Master Gardener chapter? Yeah. Anybody tell me what makes, what constitutes a true bug? So, I also won't cringe too hard if people call all arthropods bugs, it's fine. I like to call them critters. But, um, only certain group of bugs, of insects, can be called true bugs. Uh, and does anybody know what characterizes a true bug? These are in the order Hemiptera. So, hemiptera does mean half wing, so many of the true bugs have a, a leathery part of the wing and then a membranous part of the wing. Uh, but this also includes now aphids and scale insects and things like that that we'll cover. Anything special about them? Exoskeletons. Well, so they, uh, other insects have exoskeletons too. <laughs> so other insects have three pairs of legs too. What's that? Mouth parts. Mouth parts. What about the mouth parts? Perfect, yes. So that's the main thing that uh, you can do, use to identify these. They have a soda straw mouth. They all feed on liquids. Um, and most of them then, well, so what things, what types of food, what types of organisms that have liquids in them? Okay, how about humans? Yeah, we got liquids in us. So bed bugs are a parasite of us, so they suck our liquids. So anything with liquids, these will eat. Um, and so, of course, plants have a lot of liquid in them and sugary and nutritious liquids, so they feed on them, of course. Now, speaking of that, the first thing I'm gonna cover is honeydew. So many of these sucking insects, they feed on this, these, this plant sap, 
The sap is high in water and sugar, but low in fats and proteins. Now, insects have the same muscles we have. They have the same needs, a lot of the same nutritional needs that we have. So they have to eject out, they filter out a lot of these nutrients that they need and eject out the sugar water. Um, you can see there a droplet on the sharpshooter nymph. They're called sharpshooters because they shoot a stream of this honeydew out. Um, and sometimes so much that it rains down from the trees. In fact, when me and my wife were on our uh, honeymoon in Costa Rica, we were at, uh, uh, eating there, and you could see how it was beautifully sunny out, but it looked like it was raining. And it was the cicadas and all the insects from the trees just raining down honeydew. Also, if you ever park your car under a tree in the summer and you get little sticky spots on it, that's honeydew from insects. So, this is great and all uh, for them, but uh, what, are, what happens with honeydew? So, one of the things is if you see ants crawling on your plants, it's almost certainly a sign that they're going to feed on the honeydew from these types of insects. So, ants don't feed on plants. Uh, some grow fungi on dead plant material, but ants are mostly predators or scavengers. Some feed on feelings fungi, but they do love sugar water. It's like a little soda fountain for them. So if you have aphids or mealybugs or scales in your plants, uh, they will attract the ants. The ants will protect them from their predators and parasites. So that will also increase the populations of those pests. So the ants can be helping out those pest insects. So if you see ants crawling around plants, follow them up to where the source is. You may see a group of aphids. You know you need to get rid of them or something like that. Uh, also, a lot of other insects like to feed on the honeydew. So if you see a lot of wasps or flies visiting leaves on plants, I often see this on tulip poplars because they get aphids that really, you know, so there's all this, uh, all this activity on the leaves that they're also going for that free kind of soda, quick energy heat. Now, of course, if the honeydew lands onto plants, it also can promote the growth of sooty molds. So how many of you all have seen sooty mold? So it's a fairly common thing. Uh, basically, the spores are everywhere. They need some kind of uh, sugary substrate to, to grow on. They'll grow on any surface. It's a superficial kind of mold. So they'll grow on, obviously, uh, cars and vehicles parked outside for a long time. They get the sootiness. That's from these molds growing on kind of uh, nutritious materials on them. Well, honeydew is really nutritious, it's really abundant oftentimes, and it rains down on these plants and allows it to grow the mold. So, it's not a pathogen, but it does affect photosynthesis. It obviously looks terrible too. Um, and one thing to note is that the plant with the sooty mold is not necessarily the plant with the insects on it. Uh, they can be above it and raining down, and then that plant below it gets all the sooty, uh, gets all the sooty mold. Uh, there's also some really extreme cases where dripping from the insects is so much that the city mold starts to grow up into like a three-dimensional kind of thing. Uh, it's really kind of strange. So that's honeydew. So I'm bringing that up because I'm going to mention which insects uh, after this uh, produce honeydew and which don't, just so you know what to look for. Or you know if you do have city mold that you may be looking for a certain type of pest or not. Okay, aphids. How many of you all have never seen an aphid? Okay, so everybody's seen an aphid. Uh, these are small, soft-bodied insects, uh, obviously mostly found in groups. Uh, they have winged or wingless forms, depending on the species and the time of year. Many of them alternate hosts, so they'll go from like a woody uh, plant over the winter to an uh, herbaceous plant in the summer and then go back. Uh, very complex life cycles. Uh, the characteristics to identify them is they typically have these, uh, these really characteristic uh, tailpipes called uh, cornicles or siphunculi. And here actually you can see what happens. They produce actually a liquid alarm pheromone that warns other aphids nearby that there's a predator or something and that they can then scatter. Um, and so most aphids have these. Some of them have very small ones. Um, many of them transmit viruses and they also do produce honeydew and many of them produce wax or galls. Um, so I'm not gonna go over different species of aphids. They come in a lot of different sizes and forms. Uh, from, you know, very s small regular ones to this one's on the top of an acorn, a giant bark aphid. Um, uh, one's produced waxing like this, uh, this uh, Asian um, um, uh, hackberry aphid. Uh, but anyway, they typically have those cornicles in the back. Some of them, like this one, will have very small ones. Uh, but these, again, are sucking insects. Now, to ID the actual species, you have to slide mount them and look at little hairs and things like that. So. 
It's tough. Some species feed on lots and lots of, lots and lots of plants. For instance, there's a species called the cotton melon aphid. It's so uh, polypagous that they named it with two names, cotton and melon, which are completely different plants. So, um, but then other species are really specific to certain plants, like that hackberry aphid is only found on hackberries, and you wouldn't find it on anything else. Okay, any questions about aphids? No, yeah? Yes. So the, we're talking about true bugs now, that category. Yep, yeah, we're still, we're gonna be in true bugs, I'll, I'll tell you when we skip over. True bugs are, this is the bulk of this talk because they are the most common, they're very, they're very common on plants, Many of them transmit diseases, and many of them are direct pests. Uh, they're also very small, so you know, seeing them up close is going to be helpful for you. Uh, other groups, when we get into, they're so big, we're only going to cover them very generally. Okay. Yeah. So we're still in these true bugs, so the jumping plant lice are another group. So they resemble little tiny cicadas. Um, they do jump, and, uh, but they have, they're fairly host-specific. So if you know what plant you have, you usually can tell what jumping plant lice you have. Uh, and there's several families of these. Um, so there's the, a nymph of one. It looks almost like a little coin sitting on the surface. You wouldn't even think of it as an insect, uh, but it grows up in this be something like this. It's a different species, but. Um, now, these aren't super common, to, but you, you'll notice them. There's some uh, on different plants out there. In fact, uh, Yopon holly gets one that causes these little uh, curled leaves. If you break them open, you'll find those, uh, those plant lice. Uh, but the boxwood psyllid is probably one of the more common ones, of course, because boxwood is so common. Uh, and these little nymphs feed in the new growth and cause the new growth to cup around them. Uh, they also produce a lot of honeydew and wax. So if you open those little cupped leaves and see these little tiny green insects with a little bit of white wax, you know you have boxwood psyllid. There's really nothing else on boxwood that would look like that. Um, for this one, it, the control is pretty easy because you just prune out the affected air leaves, the affected twigs, and just dispose of them. You know, you can compost them or you know burn them, something like that. Uh, that'll keep the population down. They're not a really severe pest. They're probably the. They're, I'm going to talk about three different boxwood pests today, and these are the least common or least least uh, difficult to uh, um, to control. In fact, actually, I think this picture has all three boxwood pests on it, but you'll see them later. <laughs> Uh, any questions about psyllids, about jumping plant lice? Yeah, they're, they're tiny. There's, uh, I'm trying to think of some. Corn beam has a little yellowish one, uh, but it doesn't really cause much problems. But I'm trying to think, there aren't a lot that are really problematic. Um, um, persimmon has one that can cause some distorted leaves and things, and wax and honeydew and stuff. Now, white flies. How many people have seen white flies? Okay, what, what kind of plants have you seen them on? Okay. Anything, anybody else? Azalea? Azalea? Well, it, I'm thinking it was a white fly, but I'm not Yeah, sure. maybe something else. I don't know. I haven't heard it. It was white and it flew. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If it was just one, it may not be white flies. White flies are super abundant. Usually, Gardenia is the one, the common host for, that we see them on. Uh, these are tiny white waxy insects. Uh, they are not an actual fly. These are going to bug. Flies are a different order of insects. Um, there are several spirit species that are major pests. Some actually transmit viruses uh, to tomatoes, for instance. Um, the pupil, they have a crawling stage and then a resting pupil stage. And the, uh, the adults are really difficult to ID the species, but the pupae are much easier. For instance, this, uh, this right here is an adult next to its pupae. So you can see how completely different. Now we're saying pupae, what, what's a pupa? Okay, what state, you know, what's... A cocoon stage. Yeah, so cocoon is like a silk around a pupa. What, what is the stage between? Yes, so, so that's typically what it is. So like in the, in the whole metabolism, well, things with complete metamorphosis. But these are bugs, which technically don't have complete metamorphosis. But we call them pupae, and kind of in quotes, but fairly technically we call them that because they're so different from the adults. And just a way to distinguish them. Um, but you'll see these little kind of you know weird like th weird disc like things or these have these almost like uh, uh, crystal candy coming out of them, and uh, but they out emerges this little white kind of bug and so it's really very different and uh, and because those pupae are very different from each other those are what are helpful for ID. Um, so for instance, citrus white fly, the pupae are disc like 
and almost like coin-like with a little, almost like a ye yellow Y on them. They've got these yellow lines. Uh, this is the one that's commonly found on gardenia and citrus and other, other types, English ivy, uh, ash, uh, privet, we see it on a lot. Um, these do produce honeydew. So if your gardenia has a lot of honeydew, check on the underside of the leaves for these little discs. Look for them, those are white baby white flies. Now you can also just shake the bush certain times a year and if all these little tiny things flitter around, then you've got white flies. Um, these do, again, like I said, produce honeydew, so they can lead to acidic mold. Another one is the greenhouse white fly. You can see the pupa is very different. It's more three-dimensional. It's got this fringe of CD around it. And it's on a tomato leaf. So these are less common outdoors here in North Carolina, but can be in the kind of the warmer parts of the year. They're often greenhouse pests, uh, but also do produce honeydew. So whoever thought, whoever knew that white flies aren't always little white flies. And there's sometimes these little kind of discs. I call this one the birthday cake one, because it looks like a little, I don't know, you wouldn't want to eat it probably, but. Okay, now into the scale insects. So scale insects are another true bug uh, very small bugs, and many of them lack obvious features typical of an insect. So you would not look at this and say, you would not have assumed that that was an insect uh, if you didn't know prior. So very, very weird insects. Uh, the females are typically sessile, or they, they, don't, they don't move after their crawler stage. So when they, they're young, they have legs, they can crawl around when they're first born. And then they get to a spot, they light, they settle down, and they typically don't move after that. There are certain groups of scales that are a little bit more mobile, uh, but once they get to that spot, they're gonna stay there for, for good. Uh, however, uh, they have two different trajectories. The females will do that. The males, this, they're, as they're crawlers, they'll feed, then they'll molt, and then they'll become, they'll pupate into a male. And that male is a fly-like insect that flies around and mates with the females that are sitting everywhere else. Uh, they do, they insert their stylets and suck fluids from the plants. These do require slide mounting to ID, although some species are more uh, recognizable out in the field. Uh, and the species may have a broad or narrow host range. There's some very specific to a certain plant, others that are feeding on all different types of plants. And here you can see the difference, the, what we call sexual dimorphism. So this is a male, this fly-like insect, and that disc is the female. So the female never leaves her spot. She just waits for males to come mate, and then she'll produce eggs that hatch into crawlers that start to crawl further up the, up the tree. The crawlers can also be spread by uh, wind and rain or even animals that crawl on like, the feet of squirrels or birds and then get to a new tree, settle and be happy, and they start a new colony, and then you've got an infestation again. So, excuse me. Yes. This disc is the female, and that fly-like insect is the male. And it's feeding on them? Or? No, it's, they're mating right there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the back end of the female. <laughs> so, you know, and actually it's funny, I'll show you one, with the armor scales, the, arm, the, ma the females are under its covering, I'll show you them in a second. The males have to have a really long, you know, ones. <laughs> so, it's not a sword-like, because uh, they've got a shell to get under. So yeah, actually this is an armored scale right here. So, um, but I've uh, talked about talk about a couple of specific scale insects. So cottony cushion scale is a very large kind of primitive scale. It's primitive in that you know it's a, it's kind of a basal scale. It's kind of one of the you know older types of scales. And there you can tell because they have very long legs and long antennae. So they're kind of less scale like a more insect like. They can actually crawl around a little bit. And they're called cottony cushion scales because the females produce these large ovisacs, which is basically where the uh, wax uh, sac for the eggs to produce, to, to be in. And they're pretty large, um, almost half an inch when they're, when they're full grown with that sac. Um, so they are, they're much larger than most species. They are not native to the U.S. They're one of the classic pests. Uh, they're actually one of the first pests to be used uh, to have a classic biological control. Uh, program for so they got introduced in the U.S. in the late 1800s. Uh, they then sent people to Australia to collect all the predators and parasites to bring them here to kill them. Uh, so, in fact, the Vidalia beetle is a ladybug. I'll show you later on. Later on, is actually in North Carolina because bees are here now. But it's an Australian ladybug because it's not. It's it's speed on them. Um, I don't see much. They're they're kind of random. That you you. you you don't want to confuse these with another scale I'll talk about in a minute, but 
These are large orange ones. You'll find them on a few plants, and usually here or there, maybe some a little colony on a, on a leaf or so. Uh, but I see them on Nandina, Pinisporum, and Fatia, but also other things. They're very, they're very sporadic, I would say. And then you get into the soft scales. So these aren't always soft. Sometimes they're kind of hard, like bumps. Uh, but they are start off soft usually, and then kind of they, they swell up when they're females produce eggs, and they harden off to protect the eggs and stuff. Um, when you pull that off, that's the whole insect right there. Um, and uh, some are present indoors or in greenhouses only. Others are present outdoors. Uh, and these do produce a large amount of honeydew. Uh, so just again, this is another group that you might find sooty mold associated with. So here's some examples of soft scales. Um, you've got uh, tulip tree scales, which are similar to magnolia scales. Magnolia and tulip tree in the same family. Uh, but these are large. These are about the size of a pea. Uh, and, uh, and so that's big for a scale insect. Um, the lacanium scales on oaks are these brown, warty things. You'll sometimes find wax scales. Those are also like cottony cushion scales, where they're often on woody plants and on kind of very sporadic. Um, and they have this really thick wax-like coating. If you were to squish it, the insect is actually red and bleeds red almost. But it's got this almost like dried toothpaste kind of wax all around its body. So you can pick them off the plants and seed them and everything. Um, and then there's cottony scales, not to be confused with cottony cushion scales. They're very similar in that they produce a long ova sac. Uh, but they usually have smaller legs and they're much flatter, less, you know, they're less smaller than cottony cushion scales. But this is far more common than cottony cushion scales. In fact, has anybody ever seen a cottony scale? Has anybody? So I would say check out your hollies, uh, your um, taxis, like the ewes, get them a lot actually. I've even seen them on poison ivy and like all different types of plants. They're very polypagous. And so they'll create these long white sacs and they'll have this little insect in the front. Out of that sac, it's gonna come all the young. And uh, so uh, be on the lookout for them. They're usually on the undersides of leaves. That's another key for insects, these types of sedentary insects typically. Look on the undersides of leaves very often. Uh, if you see especially things on the top, like uh, yellow spots, things like that, flip it over, see what you can see. Any questions about soft scales? They're feeding, you know, the, the young, very young males and all the life stages of the female will feed on the plant. So they may be feeding less, but they're still contributing to it. And usually there's so many on the plant that it's really based on the population, how damaging they're going to be. Now, again, there are a lot of these, though, that are going to be on plants that aren't going to harm them or they're naturally, you know, native. They're, they're going to be, the plant kind of has evolved with them. It can, it can have them. Uh, there's other, a lot of other factors too. For instance, the oak lacanium scales and the oak scales, or even like uh, some of these other scales on other trees, when you get into kind of urban areas where it's hot, they get more abundant. Uh, whereas if you look at the same type of tree in a forest, you're going to have fewer of these scales. So um, yeah, there's a lot of different factors. And, and many, many of the scales are not going to kill outright kill a tree. Many of them will stress them out. And then a few can just kill up plants because they just go they go crazy. They just, they just encrust it completely. You want on a scale, which I'll show you in a minute, is one of those, for instance. So, yeah. Any other questions? I'm still a little confused on the yeah. life cycle. Yeah. So it's egg, then pupa, and then young. Yeah. Then young, then yeah. Then yeah, for these, they don't have a pupa, technically. White flies do because it's so different from the adult. We consider these kind of nymphs. So basically, the egg, you know, an egg is, could be a male or female. Yeah. If it's a female, it's going to be, both will become crawlers. When they settle, the male will go through, I think, one more nymphal, nymphal stage and then pupate. It'll, pup, it'll pupate because it'll have a covering uh, or, or, it'll, or it'll, yeah, it usually has this kind of envelope that it develops in this fly-like creature. The females will keep feeding on the plant and keep growing until they're a mature female that then after mating with the male will produce the eggs that the crawlers will have come out. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little complicated the life cycles of some of these insects. Um, so mealy bugs are also, oh, did, were there any other questions? Can you Good. recommend a, a, a bug mat um, that would be, yeah, a basic book, but that would show categories of true bugs and the breakdown of that and the, mm. maybe. maybe it's just too complicated. Yeah, yeah like
like there's no books except for technical books on scales. Nobody wants to look at a there's no coffee table books of scales. <laughs> but yeah, they should be. They're beautiful. They're really interesting. I love scales. Uh, they're really interesting, but they're also tiny and whatever obscure. But yeah, I can I can suggest I'll suggest some books. I think at the end there's definitely some guides. But depending on the group of insects or arthropods you're looking at, there's some really specific ones, and the general ones cover enough, but won't cover. You know, they'll mention scales, but they won't. You know, they're not as charismatic, I guess. So yeah. Well, scales, there's no app out there for it. That's, that's just, uh, I would say for butterflies and moths, uh, Seek by Nat iNaturalist is really good. I use that actually for butterflies and moths often because they're, they're, they're tough and they're, 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 it's very good at that. I will say the smaller the insect or the, the, less, uh, the less often it's observed, the, le the less power you're gonna get on those things. In fact, some of these things, they'd be like, they, you, they'd try, they would try to identify the plant, not the insect, the year. So yeah. Yeah. So the name of the book? Uh, it's an app called Seek. It's an app. Oh. Yeah, yeah. iNaturalist is the one. There's a few of them out there, though, I think. Now, mealybugs are another type of scale insect. They're technically scale. They're a little bit more mobile, and they're typically dusted with uh, wax and have these radial wax kind of filaments coming out of them. Uh, they can become pests outdoors, but only in certain situations. They're typically, or they're, they're here or there, not really causing a huge amount of problems. They're more of a problem on indoor plants and in greenhouses, typically, but you will find them outdoors as well. Um, there are some root feeding ones, so if you ever pull up a plant and you find these little tiny white things, like white waxy things on the roots, uh, even on weeds, they may be mealybugs, there are also some root aphids as well. Um, but that's really about mealybugs. Some of them transmit viruses to plants, but otherwise, they're, they kind of, they do get into high populations, especially like, like I said, indoors or places where they're really happy. They can blow up in populations and cause a lot of sooty mold because they do also produce honeydew. Um, it seems like a term that a lot of people use for a bug though. What's that? Mealybug. You always hear, I got a mealybug. <laughs> yeah, so mealy is the description of the wax, that, that, that you know, mealy wax. That's kind of, so white flies technically are covered in mealy wax too, that's where the name comes from. But yeah, exactly, so this is kind of helping you diagnose the difference between a mealybug and a, and a soft scale, yeah. Mealybugs are out there, they're fairly common and they can be a really important group. Um, but, you know, outdoors, when you, I don't really see them causing as many problems on plants as the soft scales and the armored scales, which is next. Uh, this is my favorite group of scales. They're also the largest and most uh, common group uh, they're all very tiny though, so these scales are only at most a few millimeters long. Uh, the soft scales are going to be much larger typically, uh, many times to hundreds of times as big as some of these. Uh, after settling, the female develops this thick covering, it's called a test. Uh, I've taken off the test, the covering of this female here, but all of these are other females under the bark of this azalea branch. Some of them actually grow on the surface. Others, when they are crawlers, they start to insert themselves under the bark. And as they produce this, this covering, it pushes the bark up and they live underneath the bark. And so they're camouflaged, basically. Uh, you can actually tell uh, where the crawler was because the, the first instar, the young one, doesn't produce a covering. So you'll always find this little golden shed skin on the top of, of these armor scales. Um, they have this, uh, you know, for me scientifically, when I look at them under the scope, they have this little area, the, the tail end called the pygidium, and all these little kind of glands and plates and all these kind of things are what I use to identify them. So you're not gonna be looking at that, again, unless you have a high-powered microscope and are uh, slide mounting them. But one thing to really note about these is they do not produce honeydew. So if you have a city mold problem or something like that, it is not armored scales. Uh, so why, why wouldn't they produce honeydew? Yeah, oh, it's that? So, yeah, you, see, you were getting at it, what else? Yeah, Somebody else? So actually, those are both kind of links. So, uh, they are under, not always under the bark, but always under a, a covering, so they drown themselves if they did. Um, but also, although there are some, some insects that make little tubes away from them to get the honeydew out, like a pipe almost, which is really weird. But, all red scales go, they, they would suffocate. They also, and part of this is that they also don't feed on the sap, they actually insert their stylets and feed on individual cells of the plant. So they, they don't get a lot of that liquid and that sugar, they get all what they need, so they don't produce the honeydew. So again, 
This is an important factor because a lot of people want to say, oh, I've got armored scales and there's honeydew. Well, there's obviously then some other pest producing that or producing that honeydew with the city mold. And what are they found on general? Did you say that Oh, they what's that? Where they're found, what, what plants they... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll show you that in a second, yeah. Um, so, so they are actually, uh, I don't know of any, there are no armored scales really of herbaceous plants. So anything that's an annual, where they're gonna die back every year, there really aren't any. Yes, you have a question? Why are they your favorite? Uh, <laughs> you'll see, because they come in a lot of different forms. They're easy to slide mount, because they're really flat, and they have really cool features. When you look at them under the scope, they're really amazing looking. They've got all these crazy glands, and like, like I said, the finger-like plates, and, and different species have different body shapes, and, and uh, they're just interesting. Uh, the, the, the different tests they produce, you know, you'll see that in a second. They're, they're just very diverse. That's a good question. So they actually, it depends. Certain species will feed, most of them will feed on, especially on deciduous plants, they're gonna feed on the branches because they have a life cycle that's a little over a year or so, and so the, plant, the leaves would fall and then they'd be stranded or whatever. They do feed on the leaves on more evergreen plants. Uh, and it depends though, yes, yeah, some are more on the bark uh, and the twigs, some are more on the leaves, some are on both. And so that's, that's a good distinction. Um, but as you'll see, so here's some examples of some armored scales. Uh, so if you have a camellia, which I'm sure many of you do, and you see little yellow spots on the top of the leaves, yeah. flip it over, you'll find all these little bumps and wax, like dusting of wax. This is one of the smallest armored scales we have, the tea scale. Uh, and of course, camellia is the thing that make, you make tea from. I think I have that. Um, <laughs> if you have a camellia, then you almost certainly have them. Now luckily they're not really damaging the plant. You almost always find them in the older leaves. You can always prune those out and everything. They're not, they're not gonna kill a camellia. Uh, they, but yeah, you can, you can just, you know, again, pick that leaf off. They're not gonna look good, those leaves anyway, because they start to, they turn chlorotic. They turn yellow on the top. And you can exactly find where a patch of these are on a leaf by, uh, by that yellow spot where they are. Uh, very common, very tiny, less than a millimeter long each of these insects. Um, and what's interesting is, uh, and I'll show you this in a second actually, so male and female um, scales, uh, armor scales look a bit different. So the females are much larger typically, they look, uh, they look more shell-like. The males almost always look like a smear of icing. So what's the, what do you, what do you what's going on here? What's this one? That's the male, the developing male. And that's the female. This is a minute cypress scale, so uh, arborvitae, uh, Leyland cypress, those things will have these, usually very sporadically. I've never seen them, had an, I've been in the clinic for 10 years, I've never uh, seen a huge density that will kill a plant or whatever. But you'll find them if you're searching, and they look like a little fried egg. Uh, so several of them look like fried eggs. They have a very papery test, and then that, that golden, uh, that's the shed skin of the, the nymph, the first instar nymph. The males are developed from here. Okay, here. Which one's the males, which one's the females? The brown ones are dark red. So the brown oyster shell ones or mussel shell ones are the females. The males are developing under here. So sometimes you'll actually only notice the males because the females are dark or, or under the bark. And you'll see all these males and you'll say, what's going on with my tree? Well, the males aren't really harming the tree because they're just developing these fly-like insects. But they are a sign that there are females there as well. So you'd want to treat, or you'd want to do something about it, and look closely to those females. So this is a euonymus scale. We just got a sample in that was in, completely encrusted with these scales, and these will kill plants. Um, and uh, you know, it's a very common species on euonymus. And a very common species on maples is the gloomy scale. There's a female where the test has been removed, but all those little googly eyes are all females as well. So if you see warty encrusting on maples, you can easily see it on most maples, especially in cities. Mm -hmm. That's gloomy scale, very common armor scale. Yes? Did I understand you to say that it was a year-long life cycle? So that by the time you actually see these infestations, they've been on the, on the plant or tree or whatever for a year? So they, once they settle, they often then just keep moving. So you have overlapping generations. So you often have younger ones with older ones. There's dead ones that you know you wouldn't be able to tell because they're, they're covered with that covering. So you're usually gonna have multiple overlapping generations. Um, they typically produce uh, young also constantly. So you're always having them. Soft scales typically produce their crawlers once a year. 
uh, during certain seasons, depending on the species. Uh, and then those will kind of move. They'll, they'll often also crawl up to the leaves over the summer and then crawl back to the, the bark over the winter when the leaves are going to fall. They may move a little bit more. Armored scales have no legs, the females, they have no antennae, they're just kind of like a little blob that feeds on the plant. So they're, they're less mobile, they more often encrust the plants, uh, and again, they're much smaller, typically. Okay, a couple other bugs. So lace bugs. Uh, how many of you all are familiar with lace bugs? Yes. They are beautiful little bugs. Uh, they look like little stained glass windows. They're actually really good mothers, so they'll even protect their young uh, against spiders and things like that that can easily eat them. Um, but even though they're beautiful, they also make a lot of damage on plants. So uh, these are fairly host specific. So if you know what plant you have, you can probably figure out what species of lace bug you have. Um, for instance, if you have this damage on azaleas, you have the azalea lace bug. If you have this damage on pieris right here, the uh, andromeda, that's actually the, the Andromeda lace bug, which is a close relative of the Azalea lace bug. Um, then you have a number of species on other hosts. This is the Chrysanthemum lace bug. It's on a number of different Asteraceous hosts. Um, but uh, oaks get their own lace bugs. Sycamores get a really big, a really uh, pestiferous lace bug that causes a lot of damage to the leaves. Um, so they are living on the undersides of the leaves, feeding on the plant. Uh, they defecate everywhere, they leave shed skins, they're really messy and gross, but they're also really beautiful. They're kind of an uh, interesting uh, pest. Uh, they do have several generations per year, typically, and the damage they cause is the stippling damage on the upper side of the leaf. So if you see this on the leaves, flip them over, if you see little hardened reddish-brown kind of fecal spots and maybe some shed skins, it's probably a lace bug thing. Yes, very different actually, yes. And I don't know if I mentioned lace wings, uh, but lace wings are, so these are true bugs, so they, they have nymphs and all that stuff. Lace wings are a type of uh, insect that goes through complete metamorphosis. They're predators, and they're those green kind of fluttery insects that you often find at lights even in the winter and stuff. So yeah, they're a little bit different, a, a bit different. They both have lacy wings, so that's why they call them that. Um, and, and that's why they get their name, so they get this lacy kind of look to them. Um, Are they more um, yes. uh, prevalent in warmer weather? Yes, I mean they're not they're not really active over the winter. Um, they're gonna they're gonna overwinter typically as eggs. I think uh, the eggs of some species are laid right in the plant. Uh, others are laid on top. So oak lace bugs. If you ever have an oak leaf and you see these little tiny vases, it looks like almost little tiny clay pots. Those are actually the eggs of the oak lace bug. Uh, but what happens is fairly early in the spring they'll hatch, uh, they will then start to grow, and as they grow they then have multiple generations over the warm season. Here in North Carolina, of course, we have plenty of warm weather, so yeah. You mentioned a lot of different bugs, different plants. Yeah. And how the different bugs are made through contact. What, what, what is that broader than just decapitation? What is the underpinning of that? Is it the defense of that particular plant? Is it the nutrient needs? Is it away from the outside? Yeah. What it's, yeah, it's a combination of all those things. So uh, what, you know, what causes certain plants to have, so some plants have lots of insects. So for instance, oak, if you just clip off a twig with six leaves on it, you're probably gonna find a couple, few dozen types of damage and insects and things like that. Oaks really get a lot of insects. Some plants don't get any insects on them because they're, yeah. So usually it's uh, you know, chemical defenses of the plants because they don't wanna get fed on. So oaks, tannins and things like that help, but then there are lots of insects that overcome those. So some of the kind of most famous ones are kind of the, the complexes on cabbages and things like that, because cabbage contains a lot of cabbages and broccoli, all those crucifers have a lot of really sulfur compounds that can kill insects and things. But there are lots of insects that overcame that and they love that stuff. And some even use those, those toxins in, them, in their own bodies and things like that, like, like monarchs feeding on, feeding on poisonous you know, plants and everything. So yeah, some plants also, and then some plants just tolerate it. They're just, they're so good at growing that they don't need a lot of chemicals. So they just get fed on and they just like, whatever, I'm just gonna grow. So there's lots of different things and insects, some groups of insects are much more specific. Uh, even within a group of insects, you have some species that are much more specific. So that's, you know, that's why also knowing the host and what can get on it is important. So azaleas, for instance, get a lot of different insects, but you wouldn't find like 10 species of lace bugs, just this one. 
Uh, so yeah, it's but it's good to know the host and what types of main insects get on it. Azaleas is gonna be a couple that we'll talk about. Boxwoods get a few that we will talk about. So yeah, but that's a good question. It's, but it is evolution. It's you know also there are lots of insects that come get brought into the country that the plants here don't have the defenses against, and so they overwhelm them. For instance, so great questions. Okay, now we're gonna go into things that are whole metabolists, or at least. I think I could jump back to a couple that aren't. So the, the wasps actually, uh, I'm putting it in quotes because everybody cringes when I, when I say wasp. So this isn't the stingy wasps, although many are stingy wasps, but wasps of course sting in defense if they, if they do. Um, but I'll talk about a couple of wasps that affect plants. And this is in quotes, because the first group are the sawflies. So how many of you know about sawflies, have ever experienced them? So there's actually a new one in the, in the state that Elm Zigzag Sawfly we're publishing on. It's a, uh, it feeds on elms and the young larvae cause a zigzag pattern. It's really, really cute. And then sometimes they defoliate the trees, which is not cute. Um, but the larvae are caterpillar-like, and that's an understatement, uh, often found in groups. So the, the larvae um, look like caterpillars, but they grow up to be a wasp. And, and I go, I wasp in quotes because this is a member of the order Hymenoptera, which you probably learned in your book, but they are not a stinging group. They can't sting at all. They have, they're called sawflies because they have a very flat ovipositor with saw like teeth on it, and they use that to insert their eggs into the plant tissue, and then the larvae hatch and feed on the plant. Um, various families, some feed on conifers, so you'll, they'll strip the needles right off the of pines, uh, others on hardwoods, uh, roses, uh, in the spring, you'll see little windows or little chewing marks in your, in your leaves. That's most often a sawfly. There's actually a whole group, suite of sawflies that feed on roses, for instance. Um, they can defoliate the leaves and needles, uh, and some actually bore into dead wood. So wood wasps will do that. Uh, and some are slug-like and skeletized plants. Now, how do you tell the difference between a caterpillar and a sawfly? Well, why would you want to tell the difference between a caterpillar and a sawfly? <laughs> it depends. It depends on the plant, I guess. Um, so yeah. So actually, that is one of the reasons. So that. So for instance, uh, Bt, which is used for uh, killing caterpillars, will not kill sawflies. We had a sample a uh, long, a long time ago where dogwood was getting completely defoliated by these caterpillars, and they used Bt, and they kept going. And I said, well, that's because they're sawflies. They're not caterpillars. So we got to use something else. Um, so, how do you tell the difference between a sawfly and a caterpillar? Well, what is a caterpillar? Of what? Or mostly moths, actually. But yes. So, caterpillars are lepidopter larvae, and sawflies are hymenopter and larva. And so, here are the differences. So, both have prolegs, which are these fleshy legs found on the abdomen. They're not true legs. In caterpillars, there are five or fewer pairs of prolegs. And they have tips with crochets, these little tiny hooks on them. Um, the sawflies have six or more pairs of prolegs, and they never have crochets on them. They're just bare at the end. Uh, also, the um, sawfly larvae have one what we call stema, that's the eye lens. So it looks like a, it's very comical, it just looks like one eye right there. Uh, caterpillars typically have six eyes, eye lenses in a little semicircle. They're much smaller and much less obvious. Uh, also, caterpillars will have either at least hairs like this or lots of hairs, like really fuzzy. Sawflies are rarely, rarely ever fuzzy. There's only one, the bristly rose sawfly, uh, which is fuzzy, but all the other ones are going to be either fleshy like this or have little kind of projections on them. They're not, they're not hairy at all. So that's how you can tell the difference. That also helps you with control. Um, and both can be kind of common. I, caterpillars are obviously more common than sawflies, but sawflies can be pretty common as well. Do birds use the sawfly caterpillars as food as well? They probably sometimes, but they, uh, so they often live in groups and they will rear up and spit out nasty fluids and stuff and they're kind of, they, or they all twitch at once and like scare away things. So they're, they're good at, because they're out there, they're good at trying to defend themselves. Other sawflies look like little slugs, like look, look almost like jelly. Uh, they're kind of probably unappetizing. And many of the sawflies also grow wax all over them. Uh, so 
I don't know, they probably, they're probably not good tasting either. Um, but yeah, they, the spitting and all that stuff is probably not, birds don't want to mess with that. Um, it's safe, but there are lots of caterpillars doing the same thing too. I'm sorry, you might have said this, but where do you see them in the landscape? So they're going to be on, usually on foliage or needles. So, um, um, trees mostly? Yes, mostly trees, I'm trying to think. They're on other things too, but they're not going to be much of a pest. They're kind of more, there are certain uh, sulfides that are more pests than others, but they're going to be, many of the species are less pests than kind of other types of insects. Um, but they they are basically all plant feeders. All the sulfides are plant feeders. There's one group that's parasitic, and they actually led to all the parasitic, other parasitic wasps and stinging wasps and things. So it's actually a kind of what we, we don't really call primitive, but they're a basal group of, of wasps. So they start off feeding on plants, they had caterpillar-like larvae, and then they became more predators and parasites. And I don't talk about those much today. We can talk about parasitoids and whatnot uh, at, when we can discuss, but. The other group of wasps that you're gonna see are the gall wasps. Uh, so these are also non-stinging. They can't hurt you. You could totally hold that one and it wouldn't hurt you. Um, the larvae, basically they can, if you're a plant though, they will sting you because they wanna lay the eggs in, um, in the plant and then the grub-like larva causes the plant to grow these growths. Um, and so this will be your first, I guess, show and tell. So, um, they can, I don't know if you want to hand these out, we can hand these out and round. Okay, we can take a look and go back to here with, with a couple. So, so, um, so this type of wasp, uh, they often alternate generations. So there's often a twig swelling uh, generation and then a really flamboyant leaf, uh, leaf or twig uh, gall they make. Now, galls are just uh, growths, like a kind of tumor-like growth on a, on a plant. It could be caused by all different things, but most commonly it's insects and other arthropods, so mites, I'll talk about them later, that cause galls. There's some bacteria that cause galls, but insects are the major group. And on oaks, uh, gall wasps are the major group. And so they have detachable galls, so there's, a, there's leaf galls, I'm passing around some different ones. Uh, the little hole in the gall is where the wasp emerge. And, uh, Basically, these typically are, are common and you see them. Uh, roses also get some of these wasp galls and a few other plants, but oaks are, you know, 95% of gall wasps are on oaks. And each oak can have multiple types of gall wasps on it. Uh, and they create different types of galls, and actually gall and the, the type of gall and the species of oak can tell you what species of gall wasp you have, um, especially those really flamboyant ones. But they basically pre reprogram the plant to grow this nutritious food and they live inside and feed on it. Now luckily these, these are more of an eyesore than anything else. So and they, actually some of them are really beautiful like these, the wool sower gall, which is this big puff ball with these pink dots on it and everything. It's amazing how these got, get the plant to grow like that. But um, they're typically only aesthetically damaging. So the oaks can handle them. Uh, it can sometimes cause uh, breaking of the twigs or or girdling of twigs in really high densities. But this is something we really don't worry about much. And also, with a big oak, it's, all, it's basically impossible to control these. So, yes? I was just wondering, am I looking at several different galls all around it? Yeah, so that's, that's one that has uh, a multilocular, so it's got many compartments in it. So some will only have one wasp in the gall, like this one only has one wasp in the middle. You can cut one of these open when it's fresh, and and kind of snap it open, you can see a little chamber and a little kind of grub in there. That's the wasp larva. That one has multiple wasp larvae in the same kind of, in, in separate compartments of the same growth. And that one is actually, we would call it integral, so you couldn't break that off the plant without snapping a twig. Others are called detachable because you can just snap them off and it wouldn't harm the twig of the leaf. So all different types out there, thousands of species out there. In fact, one of the the, the famous facts about this is that uh, uh, Alfred Kinsey, the famous uh, sex researcher, he started out as a world expert on gall wasps. That was his group. And because they had such weird sex behavior, all that stuff, it, it was a, uh, probably led to the part we let that stuff. Okay, some caterpillars. Bagworms. How many of you all? Yeah, a lot. Okay, so we'll pass around to bagworms. So, um, yeah. Okay, there's a bagworm. Well, they're not alive anymore, so 
or if they were, I'd be very surprised because these are old specimens. So, uh, bagworms. Um, these are uh, medium to large caterpillars that create this, uh, this debris case. They, they have silk. Uh, most caterpillars, actually all caterpillars can produce silk uh, from their mouth parts. And so these collect debris and cover their body while they walk around to protect them. So I'd like to talk about these uh, bagworms uh, depending on what time of year I'm giving the talk. So these have one generation per year. So right now, out there on trees and plants, are the bags that either are empty, with, that had a male come out of it. So, let's see if I can, no, well, here, if anyone is brave enough to touch these. They're, those are the male skins. So the, the males, so basically right now they're either empty bags. Yeah, I don't know how you can fit here. Yeah, you can pass around there. Um, they're either empty bags where the male was, or they are a bag with a dead female and a bunch of eggs in it. So the eggs are overwintering in that bag. In about May or June, it starts to warm up, and the larvae are going to hatch from that bag and crawl out to the tree. They're going to start feeding, and they're going to be real tiny. They're still going to have little tiny bags, but you won't see them. And so that's the best time to control them. Actually, the best time to control them is right now, where you remove the bags on any of the plants that you have uh, issues with. Now, note, you don't want to just rip the bag off. Why? It could, yeah, it could technically. Uh, no, the, you can just, you can, if you ripped it off, you could just toss the bag in the compost or burn it or drown it or something, I don't know, something horrible. Um, but if you just rip it off, what happens is the silk is so strong that it, this is the silk line from one of them, that it remains on the twig and it girdles the twig. So as the twig grows, it'll strangle the twig. So you want to take a little razor and kind of cut off the silk tie and then untie it from there because if you want to pass that around, that's, that's, yeah. Yes. So those are the pupil skins of the male. So they usually stick out of the bottom of the bag. So again, so May or June, they're going to hatch. They're going to come out and feed. Once they get to a large size, you're not going to be able to control them. The chemicals just don't work. They're too big and too hefty. Uh, and that's usually when people notice them. So definitely keep an eye on, on plants that have these in the past. Look for the bags. Get rid of them while they have the eggs in them because you'll be taking out a huge amount of the population. For instance, right now until May or so. Once they are fed a lot and they're happy and, and going to turn into an adult, they tie off that, that bag, like I showed you, and they develop. One, the bags that have males will develop into a moth that will pop out. The bags that have females in it, the female will never leave the bag. And so the male will go mate with the bag with the female in it. She will then produce eggs, he'll die, and then she'll die. And then over winter you have the eggs and we're back to right now. So. Best time to control them is to get rid of the bags while you can before the eggs hatch and you get lots of them. In fact, we had a branch come in about that big on Arborvitae, and there were, I think I counted 30 or 40 little baby bagworms on just that section. So, yes. Uh, what plants? They are often on conifers, like junipers and arborvitae, things like that, but they get on all different things. This is on cherry laurel. That's actually one of the ones you're passing around right now. And so they get on other, on, on broadleaf plants as well. Okay, bagworms. Uh, prominence, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna talk about these very quickly, but these are often a summertime, these are one generation a year. They're very large caterpillars, striped, typically with a little bit of hair, sometimes with a lot of hair. Um, they affect all different types of plants. There's walnut uh, prominence that, you know, sometimes it masses on the trunk and they'll twitch together to freak you out, which is the point. Um, and then you've got things like, this is the azalea prominent, the tandem major, on the same twig as another species, and this is a wild blueberry. Now why would they be a blueberry if they're the azalea prominent? Acid. What? Acid. What was the question? Why, why would the azalea prominent be on a blueberry? Uh, what's that? What was the question? Why would an azalea prominent be on a blueberry? Gets back to your question. Azalea and blueberry are close relatives. They're both ericaceous hosts, so they're both uh, close relatives. So that kind of, you know, that's part of it. The, so, so blueberries and azaleas are close relatives. So that's why I can kind of go all different types of plants. So it mostly is on ericaceous hosts, which ericaceae is a really cool family of plants, by the way. 
Um, so anyway, uh, these can be around. Um, uh, and then there are also, I think I talked about oak worms too. Yeah, yeah. So there's another similar one that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, actually, I'll just go to that. The oak worms. So also another pest, uh, big caterpillar in the summer that's striped are the oak worms. As the name implies, they are on oaks. Uh, the most complaints we get about these is they produce large green black fecal pellets that rain down from trees onto, onto driveways and patios and decks and stuff. Uh, when it's wet out, they get very slippery and it's all poop, slippery poop, which is great. Um, so, but they typically don't harm the oaks. They're going to feed very, they're going to have very small caterpillars and this is the same for the prominence. Very small caterpillars are usually feeding in groups on a leaf that you don't notice. And as they get bigger, there's only a few per leaf just completely defoliating the plant. Uh, but oak trees, especially mature oak trees, can handle them just fine. And they're usually too far up to handle. You can prune them out or something like that, but most of the mess is what people are concerned about. So they'll try and prune out those branches that are over if they get infestations year to year. Uh, these, both these groups of caterpillars, you may not see for a while. And then at some point, you'll see them crawling down trees and crawling around the yard to go look for pupation sites. So they'll dig under the ground pupate over winter, and then the next year they'll pop up as, as adults. The adults of these are actually uh, related to luna moths. They're small orange uh, Saturnids, giant silkworm moths. Uh, the adults of these are kind of just a brown leaf-like moth. Uh, so they're different groups of moths, uh, but very similar looking and kind of big striped caterpillars in the summer. Uh, fall cankerworms, how many of you all have heard of fall cankerworms? So, um, fall canker worms uh, right now is when there may still be females mating with the with the males. Females are wingless moths, so you would never think that, that was a moth, uh, but it's uh, but it is. And the males are winged, and so the females climb up on on surfaces, usually trees. A call to the males, the males will come and mate with them. They'll lay eggs, then die. And what happens is in the spring, the, the caterpillars hatch. And so we call them fall canker worms because the adults are active typically in the, once the cold weather starts over the winter, which is not unusual for moths because they're, they're covered in scales, they're really warm. Uh, so they can be active even in the winter. Uh, the larvae hatch and are these little inchworms. And how you tell them from other inchworms is that they have two pairs of big pro legs, which most inchworms have, a uh, true inchworm. But these also have a little tiny stubby pair right here, which is unique among all the other inchworms around. But if you see a little in the spring, a little kind of string with like a little tiny green inchworm there, it's probably them. Now, when I first got here, there were big outbreaks all across the state of them, stripping trees completely bare. I haven't seen that kind of outbreak, but it could happen any year depending on certain circumstances. And so you'll get them stripping them. Now, with many foliage feeding insects, and this is kind of an overarching kind of idea is that if, especially if it's, a, if it's a healthy plant and it's a deciduous plant, it's going to grow those leaves again. So many of them are tolerated just fine. So you don't really have to worry about them that much. If they make it unsightly, that's kind of your problem, not the plant's problem. It's, the plant doesn't really care. It's just getting a haircut, I guess. Um, but if they look bad, then you might want to control these things. Are there, are there some in the turf as well? <laughs> so there are caterpillars in turf. So fall army worms and sod web worms, which we really don't get many of the sod web worms here. Uh, they're more of the southeastern part of the state. But army, fall army worm outbreaks every once in a while and will strip you know, the grass down to the ground too. So yeah. So your overarching statement about caterpillars, they're going to be your, your new winter. And if they totally just dominate, it's going to be really like the one that's gone over that seed and just wow. Oh, yeah, I know that one, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing you got to observe is, okay, does the plant come back healthy every year? It's a baby, yeah. It's a baby, yeah. So, baby, so that's the thing, though. you got to monitor this. So small plants are more susceptible to being killed by that. If it's a much more, it's an established plant, it's much more healthy, uh, it can lose those leaves. Now, the one on Baptisia is, is, a, is an imported moth that it does is really bad. It, you, you, that's probably one you want to monitor for and maybe control because they will strip the plants you know, year after year. They're, very, they're pretty much predictable. Uh, these other things, they're going to feed on some leaves on the oaks or things like that. A big oak does not care. It is involved with them. These are native uh, moths. And so the oak tolerates it fine. Um, so yeah. So really, you've got to base it on how you know, small or young the plant. If it's unhealthy otherwise, those can push it over the edge. Insects can push it over the edge. Um, 
But I would say most foliar feeders, it's more kind of like, okay, I don't like these holes in the way it leaves. It doesn't look, it looks kind of ratty. The plant you know, doesn't really care that much, especially late season ones. Most of these are later in the summer. The, the plant has done a lot of its growing. Uh, we, we say if it's defoliated year after year, it can start to cause issues because it's not getting enough energy. If it's only defoliated once a year, especially after, uh, after it's grown a lot, it's not going to care. Those leaves are going to be falling in a few months anyway, so it's not a big deal. So, but. Okay, now fall webworms and tent caterpillars. Uh, these are the two that create these silk tents in trees. Um, so the fall webworms are present in late summer and fall. They've got these long CD, these really long hairs, longer than half the body. Uh, and then these tent caterpillars are spring species uh, that have this, uh, they're fuzzy with this white stripe down the back. Um, the tent caterpillars really mostly feed on cherries uh, and apples, things like that. And the fall webworms feed on just about everything. So if you're driving down the highway and you see all those big tents in the trees, that's almost always fall webworm. And that's usually in the late summer, early fall. Uh, they also, where they make the nests is a little different. So fall webworms, again, near, near the outside of the branches, they'll make these webs. Uh, uh, tent caterpillars will make them in the crotch of the tree. Again, usually rosaceous hosts, like, like uh, you know, uh, cherries and, and apples and things like that. Tent caterpillar eggs are really distinct. They're in this foamy mass that's hardened. So if you find those on branches of your plants that you like, you can, uh, they overwinter, you can just scrape them off and that gets rid of all those eggs. Um, these will defoliate plants, but again, they're native. They are, you know, the plants can handle it typically. They will grow year after year. Again, observe your plants well, make sure that they're healthy still. Uh, but if you need to control them, you can, if you catch them early on, you just prune out that section of the plant and destroy that, that starting tent. You can also just rip open the tent with a kind of pole trimmer or something like that, and that'll allow birds and other and parasites and things like that to get in there to feed on them. You can treat foliage nearby that they'll feed on, but the sprays won't get into that, that tent. Don't use fire. I probably shouldn't have to tell you that. <laughs> See, because trees, trees are made out of this stuff we call wood. And it burns real well, so. Okay, yes? Is that what people call gypsy moth? Gypsy moth is a different type of moth. Uh, they don't typically, they don't create the massive silk webs. Uh, they are kind of closely related. Uh, to to these uh, these moths too, uh, we have some other tussock moth relatives that are close to the gypsy moth. Gypsy moth is fairly uncommon in North Carolina. Uh, it's and it's more near the kind of northeastern part of the state. They're more of a north northern group, uh, but I can show you a picture later on if you want to see. Any other questions? Good, great questions. Everybody's awake, luckily. Um, okay, uh, clear wing borers. These are probably the most important uh, caterpillar pests. This is because they bore into the plant, and that's where we're gonna, the big distinction is. Foliar pests, you know, the leaves are kinda like hair on the, you know, they're useful hair, but it's like they shed them, they, or the leaves are kinda disposable. The actual base and root of the plant is really obviously vital to their life of the plant. If you cut that off, you damage the vascular system or things like that, that will kill the whole plant. It's like strangling the plant. So these bore into plants, uh, many of them, basically, most of them are, are day flying uh, wasp mimics. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, raspberry crown borer, uh, which can kill raspberry and blackberry plants, looks almost exactly like a yellow jacket. Uh, I'd love to show you a picture later. But this is the peach tree borer, and this is the larva of peach tree borer. They will bore in the bases of plants, even including cherry laurel, which is a, technically a prunus. Uh, and uh, those will then cause issues. Uh, also, squash vine borer. I mean, they tried to grow squash, and you get those. It's a really beautiful moth. The larvae are gross little grubs that live inside the base of the plant and poop everywhere and just make the plant melt after that. They don't care that you, for all they know, you're growing the plant for them. Uh, but the problem is, once they get in the plant, they're very difficult to control. So you want to scout for the adults. You want to look for eggs. You want to remove those. You want to, you know, monitor those things. Yes. Yeah, so that could be a sign of them, but so prunus and other, especially um, peaches, other stone fruit, cherries, things like that, 
they produce a lot of this uh, jelly-like substance that we call gamosis. And it is, a, it is a common sign of a lot of different things. It's basically like their way of, of freaking out. Uh, so it can be just a crack or some kind of physical damage or something like that. It can be diseases that cause that, uh, like cankers or things like that. The plant will then use those. But also these will produce scumosis because when they bore into the plant, the plant's like that, doing that. Now, you oftentimes also may find some frass. You'll find little pellet-like frass in there. So the best thing to do for those is to wipe away that section of gamosis, or the gumminess, and look at what is there. If there's a borehole, it, probably, it could be a bore. If it's just a crack or something like that, it's probably some other stress factor or disease or something like that. And we can help you identify those things. The problem with those stone fruits, especially right here in North Carolina, especially nowadays, they're not toler they don't tolerate our climate very well. So cherries and plums and things like that, especially here in the central and eastern part of the state, it's too warm for them. We had, a, we had one die, it died from a disease too, but it was just stressed. And what happens is when plants are stressed, they, they, they're more susceptible to pests and things like that. They're, they even some plants, when they're stressed, they attract pests because they're, they're weakling, because they're a weak thing that can easily be overcome. So those are some things to do. Wipe away the gum, look for the, any other symptoms. If you find this hole, if you find that sawdust like frass, it's almost like little pellets, yeah. that's probably a borer. Um, and, and if it's pellets and silk, it's almost certainly a uh, moth borer, because there are also beetle borers that will come into those plants, especially when they're stressed as well. Yeah. Uh, what time of the year do you look for those? What kind of what? What time, what time of the year? year? Yeah, so the moth, well, so each group, each species, and depending on the crop, it's different times of year. So squash vine borer is going to be a little earlier in the year, uh, you know, early summer, so late spring, early summer is when the moths, the adults will be flying. Peach tree borer, for instance, though, is is late summer, early fall. They'll come, this one was flying around my, that, that prunus that, uh, it was uh, one of those uh, apricot, you know, those ornamental apricot trees or whatever. We moved into the house and had it. It was all right, but it kept declining. And we saw those, I saw those flying around the base of the tree. They'll lay their eggs near the base of the tree and then the larvae will bore in. So that's the time to get them, but you really have to be perfect timing to get them. So. If your plant is healthy, it's probably not going to be as bad, but look out for these moths flying around uh, in late summer, early fall uh, for peach tree borer. But there's lots of different clear wing borer moths out there for different types of plants, too. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, uh, thrips. Uh, thrips are not a whole metabolist group. They don't go through complete metamorphosis. How many of you all have heard of thrips? Okay, good, good. How many of you all know that thrips is both singular and plural? So if you see one thrips, it's a thrips. And if you see two thrips, it's two thrips. So if you say thrip, uh, an entomologist dies. No, uh, maybe, maybe metaphorically, I, I do die a little bit when I hear thrip. So say thrips, never say thrip. It's hard. Okay. Mostly plant feeders, though fun, some feed on fungal spores or other insects. There are even some beneficial thrips that feed on spider mites and things like that. Uh, in fact, I learned recently that Western flower thrips, one of the most pestiferous thrip species, also feeds on spider mites and things like that when it wants to. So they can be beneficial sometimes. They're often yellow, but also come in darker or banded forms. Uh, they have thin strap-like wings uh, with fringe seed, and they're all tiny. They're all, most are under three millimeters long. I think the family is tough, you gotta slide mount them, but uh, they are important because many transmit viruses like tomato spot wilt virus, uh, um, and some others. So common thrips in the, fam in the genus Franklin the yellow are really the ones that are most important. Here's a thrips larva and an adult. Now there's another group where it doesn't undergo complete metamorphosis, but we call the young larvae. It does have a resting pupil stage and an adult stage. Now the pupa doesn't look very different, but we call it that because it does, it's a non-feeding stage between the larva and the adult. So in thrips, the first two young ones, the larvae feed, then they go through two or three resting stages, sometimes even in silk cocoon, sometimes in the ground, other places. And then the adult also feeds. Um, now, thrips feeding damage on flowers, uh, they'll feed on, the, on them and they might suck out the collar. So if you see little kind of white spots on pink flowers that may be thrips, if you open up flowers, you often find little tiny yellow, look like little tiny yellow lizard-like things kind of crawling around and stuff. They hop around and kind of fly. Um, but one of the common characteristics of their feeding damage on plants 
is these pale or silvery patches with lots of green or black specks. They're very dirty when they, when they feed. They feed and they poop at the same time, basically. So it's all those are fecal specks all over it. Really common damage uh, that if you find on a plant these little sunken patches with those black specks all over it, probably almost certainly thrips. Look for those little tiny yellow insects. That's all I have time for this. OK, final few things. Beetles. So beetles are a huge group of, of insects. How many species do you think are described in the world? Way too many. Way too, not, not too many. No, no, no. <laughs> They're not enough, actually. But uh, Now, there was a paper that came out that said hymenopter, the wasps, are probably going to outpace the beetles at some point, which is probably true. They're more, less studied. There are more parasites feeding on all different species. But right now, they're the biggest group of insects on Earth, actually the biggest group of organisms on Earth. There are more beetles than there are plants out there. So there are 350,000 species described of beetles. Uh, how many species of mammals? You know, we're mammals. How many species of mammals are there? 500. Oh, what's that? 500? That's, that's, yeah, that's a little low. You, we have more than that. But about almost five or 6,000 species of mammals. So there are. There are more weevils. There are 10 times as many weevils as there are mammals on Earth. So huge groups. I'm only going to go into these superficially. The first is scarab beetles. So these have uh, antennae where the, the tip of it opens up like fingers. Uh, the most famous one you're going to know is the Japanese beetle. Uh, yeah, boo, everybody. <laughs> they are very beautiful, I will say. But they're one a group. The scarabs are an interesting group. The larvae and the adults uh, can be pests sometimes. Many of the larvae are decomposers, though. And many are, are actually beneficial, like dung beetles. But uh, white grubs can sometimes feed on turf roots, and they will cause damage in turf. Uh, and adults of many species, like, uh, like uh, especially um, uh, Japanese beetles, will feed on foliage of roses and grapes and things like that. Um, but they're a really diverse group. A lot of them don't do any damage to any plants. Uh, they're just kind of out there. Or they're feeding in the turf, but not causing an issue. So. Uh, just know about them. You obviously know about Japanese beetles, but there's a lot of others too. Leaf beetles, really extremely diverse in size, color, and shape. These are both leaf beetles. That's a torus beetle, and that's a striped cucumber beetle. You wouldn't even think they were related, but they're in the same family. Uh, they typically have antennae that are kind of expanded at the tip a little bit, but not clubbed, not kind of simple, not very long either, like less than half the length of the body. Um, larvae are caterpillar or worm-like. Uh, most often in the soil, so you won't see them, but some actually feed on the foliage too and are pests themselves. This is another group where the adults, the larvae, or both can be pests, so it's one to know well. Um, and some transmit bacterial will. So the striped cucumber beetle, it feeds on a, on a cucurbit, a, a squash that has um, bacterial will in it. It then moves to another plant, it feeds, it defecates, the feces have bacteria in it, it gets into a plant wound, and that plant is now infected. So this can happen, um, and they can also just be primary pests. You see this one munching down on the stem of a cucumber. So um, they can be really common pests, but they're super diverse. Uh, so there's a leaf mining one. The larvae live in between the upper and lower surface of the leaf. Uh, this is a case-bearing one. Um, the larvae have a little poop case that they carry around with them, much like a bagworm, but it's made out of poop. Uh, this one actually looks like poop. It actually tucks its legs in and <laughs> pretends to be caterpillar feces. Uh, then you have red-headed flea beetles, which are really common, polyphagous pests in nurseries. This one's feeding on rosemary, so you'd think that it wouldn't feed on rosemary, but they're fine with that. And uh, skeletonizing it. This is an oak leaf beetle, and this is the imported willow leaf beetle, uh, the larvae and the adult, uh, which the adults feed on the willow leaves as well as the larvae. Uh, so the larvae won't have pro legs like true caterpillars, um, and, but they are very caterpillar-like. These are small, these are tiny, and they're called flea beetles because they have these large hind legs that they use to jump. Yeah? No, I'm just reacting. I have so many flea beetles at my <laughs> what, 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 what are they on? Uh, grass cutting. Yep. So, that they, so flea beetles are a super common group of, of uh, leaf beetles. Uh, Red-headed flea beetle is huge. It's a giant compared to them, and it's only a quarter of an inch long. So most flea beetles are very tiny. There's a whole suite of them that feed on solanaceous crops, so eggplant and potato, they'll leave shot holes in the leaves. Because we don't usually eat the leaves of those plants, they're not, they're not a big issue. But for uh, brassicans, like, 
squat, I mean, like uh, cabbages and things like that that we eat the leaves of, there are many species that feed on them as well. They've overcome those toxins and stuff. And they are little tiny, tiny, they're usually, they're probably gonna be striped flea beetles, the little kind of elongate black with a little yellow stripe. Uh, yeah, so that's a common one that feeds. There's also le other leaf beetles, larger, like yellow margin leaf beetles that feed on brassicans, but they're not a flea beetle. They don't hop, they're much larger than them, but they're also a leaf beetle. So yeah, they're, they're a great group because they're super, super diverse. There's some pests, there's some really important pests, like corn rootworm is actually the, the name for the larva that feeds on the roots of corn, but the adult is the spotted cucumber beetle. So it's that green ladybug-like one. Or this, uh, so the adult can be feeding on different things than the larva, they can both be pests. Really interesting group, but a lot of them are not pests, they're out there feeding on wild plants that, you know, they're just doing their thing. Now longhorns are close relative of the leaf beetles, really diverse in uh, size, color, and shape, but most of them are elongate with really long antennae, uh, a flat face, they have, the eyes are usually kidney shaped or even divided completely, the antenna kind of inserts in the eye. Um, the, they're mostly kind of dull colored, they, they often look like bark or whatever because they feed on, almost always, on dead and dying woody plants. Uh, the larvae are grub-like, uh, they have little tiny legs or no legs, but they feed under the bark of dead or drying trees. Um, there is one species, that, well, there are a few species that girdle twigs to create a dead twig, and then they lay their egg and the, the dead the part of it's gonna die. There are also, we've had some, there are a few that feed on herbaceous plants or azaleas and things like that, and they can't feed on the healthy plants, so again, they girdle, they chew a, a, a ring around the stem, and then lay their eggs above it because they want that dead plant. So they really need, they really like dead or dying things. So my big point here is oftentimes people have a plant or tree that's dying, they peel apart the bark and they see big grubs or things like that under there. And they say, these things kill my plant. It's almost certainly not the case. It's very rarely is that the case. You have to know what type of plant has a species that might attack it primarily, but most, almost all of these are secondary uh, pests. They come in, there's decomposers, they get in there, they start to decompose the plant. They want an unhealthy plant. So they are really more of a sign that your plant is unhealthy rather than the cause of that unhealthiness. Oftentimes people will send us pictures of a dead pine and there are holes in it and they say, well, these beetles, there's beetle holes, they kill the pine. If they're dry holes, that pine was dead when they started to invade it. They want that dead tissue. They, they need that dead plant to feed on, not a live plant. So I, this is just a warning. So going to the next group too, is that really these are signs rather than a cause of the plant death usually. Uh, and some of them are very large. Now, there are some exceptions. There are some, like I said, that will girdle the plant to a healthy plant to make it dead. Also, the Asian longhorn beetle is one that will primarily, primarily attacks maples, and they will bore into a healthy plant. They create pencil-sized boreholes into plants and will kill those trees. There's now an infestation down in Charleston, South Carolina, so it's close by. These are huge, beautiful, black with white spot beetles, but they are non-native and they attack healthy plants. But Otherwise, longhorns are really not going to be causing issues. I'll show you another example. I'll show you an example afterward if we, we get a chance. Um, I don't think I have any of them here. Uh, although you can see sometimes, this is actually, I don't go over jewel beetles, but this is emerald ash for damage on ash, so it creates this really distinct serpentine. So that's another case where if you know your plant and you know this type of pest that can actually kill it, that's good because you, you can then say, okay, this is definitely killed by this, this beetle and we can pass around here. And, um, but for the most part, these are gonna be you know, secondary things. That gets into weevils. So weevils are a group of beetles that have a snout typically. The larvae are legless. Uh, some of the larvae feed on the foliage actually, but most of them are under the ground, feeding on roots and other things. Uh, the, this is another group where the adults, the larvae are both maybe pests. Most of these feed on kind of green plants, but we'll get into a group that doesn't. Uh, that feeds on dead and dying plants, typically. So um, they have an elbowed antennae, uh, and they're usually a snout. This is a broad nose weevil. This is actually a two-banded Japanese weevil, which is a really common pest of foliage of plants. They create notches in the edges of leaves. So they usually chew from the edge of the leaves. So if you see little kind of worm-like chew marks in the viburnums or things like that, it's often a weevil doing that. Um, let's see. Uh, some are stored product pests, so you sometimes find them in households, little tiny weevils in, granary, in grains. 
But one of the specialized groups of weevils are bark and ambrosia beetles. How many of you have heard of, of these? Ashley's nodding her head, so you probably all should have, oh no, she's not saying, oh, you should all hear that. <laughs> bark and ambrosia beetles are a really special group of weevils. They don't have a snout like other ones. They're usually small and pill-shaped, uh, usually only a few millimeters long. Uh, but these beetles uh, lay their eggs into dead or dying trees. Their larvae either feed under the bark, up and down under the bark, uh, they can create these really beautiful patterns in the, under the bark. And those are called bark beetles. The ambrosia beetles bore straight into the wood, and they don't actually feed on the wood. Does anybody know what they feed on? Probably says it up here. Yeah. So they actually carry fungal spores with them, and they grow fungi in those galleries. In those, in those, so they bore straight into the wood. When they bore, they create these frass toothpicks. It's like a sawdust toothpick coming out. How many of you all have ever seen little toothpicks coming out of a tree? So that, so that's an ambrosia beetle boring in there. They're just scraping out that wood, and then they're lining the inside with the fungal spores. And because the tree is dead or dying, those fungi grow, and they're gardeners, just like you. So the larvae feed on the garden fungi. There are even some species that bore right nearby, and they don't grow their own. They just let the fungus grow into their two kennels. Weird stuff. They're also really weird in that the ambrosia beetles typically, that's the female will invade and lay a bunch of eggs. One will be unfertilized, will turn into a male, and all the fertilized eggs will turn into females, and then the male will mate with his sisters, and then the sisters will go out and affect new plants and stuff. So, this is also another thing I need to stress, that if you see those toothpicks coming out, it's almost certain that that plant is stressed out and is, and is being attacked by ambrosia beetles. There are a few species that attack primarily plants, for instance, red bays, or sassafras, things like that, getting attacked by red bay ambrosia beetle. It's a non-native one that attacks healthy plants, so that's totally a case where they're, they're an issue. But for the most part, they're primary decomposers as well. So, let me ask you this. How do you know when a plant is sick? How'd you figure that out? What's that? Yeah, how'd you observe it? When it's healthy, when it was great. Yeah, but how'd you observe it? Guys, have you ever smelled a plant to see if it's healthy or not? Yeah, you can't do that. Beetles can, though. These beetles with their antennae can sense when a plant is stressed, even when it's still green. So plants produce ethanol and lots of other chemicals when they're stressed. And before it even starts turning yellow or wilt or anything like that, it's screaming out with these chemicals. And these beetles are very good at picking up on those. So they will find that before you know it's unhealthy and attack it. So that's why people start to think, oh, the beetles are attacking it and then it died. No, it was dying some other way and you just didn't notice it because you're human and you're not able to smell the plants screaming out. So they bore into there and they're looking for these unhealthy plants because that's where their fungi can grow. Uh, they've even done these experiments where they, they cage the beetles up next to trees and they, they flood certain trees to stress them out and though those beetles will bore right into those trees. The other ones are not interested in the tree at all. They're also everywhere around so they'd be attacking every tree if they were really good at attacking trees. So I want to drill that into your brains because this is a very common, people will always call up and say ambrosia beetles kill my tree. Was it a red bay? Was it, was it some? No, then it's not ambrosia beetles. <coughs> also pine beetles are the same. Pine beetles are a type of bark beetle. They break out every once in a while, but we haven't had an outbreak in North Carolina in decades. And if you have a dead pine uh, that has dry holes in it, it's not pine beetles. Pine beetles attack the tree when it's healthy and alive. The, the trees produce resin that then to try and push out the beetles. So you have all these little resin bits everywhere. If it's dry holes, there's something else that killed that tree. Don't blame the beetles. They're just there to feed on the, the carcass, basically. Mm. Yes. They're, they're out in the environment, so they're flying around looking for any plant that's going to be good but for them. But how do they come to that plant? If there's no physical sign, are they, they, they smell it. They smell yeah. it. Yeah, it's like smelling your rest, favorite restaurant and just so, coming. Yeah, but, they, but they can pick up yeah. how dogs can sense, smell cancer yeah. and a seizure that's about to come and all kinds of things. I, I'm just wondering if there's any kind of... 
I mean, it's, it's similar. They, they need those plants, so they're going to evolve to really smell those and be the first ones there. And so they're going to kind of get better and better at finding plants that are unhealthy. And so, because they, again, they don't, they can't use a healthy plant, they're not going to be attracted to healthy plants. Why? Is there another question there? We, I gotta, we, we're running out of time. I just want to get to all these. <laughs> Um, okay, so Barbara and Rosemary, let's go a couple, two more groups, flies and mites. Uh, flies, so the second box of pests I want to talk about is the box of the leaf mite. So this little midge-like fly has these little maggots that live in the leaves. So if you see these blisters on boxwoods, break open the leaves, you'll find these little tiny yellow or orange maggots. That's box of the leaf mite. That's the second most common boxwood pest, I would say. Uh, it is. They have one generation per year. Usually in the spring is when the adults are swarming the plants. That's the best time for a contact pesticide. But there are systemic pesticides that can help kill the larvae in the leaves too. Uh, but the larvae then develop the rest of the year, emerge the next year as adults. The cycle continues. Um, there's another type of leaf miner. These are completely dissimilarly related flies. Uh, does anybody remember what, what, uh, what, uh, how you distinguish flies from other insects? Now these are homotalous, so they have a larval stage, the maggot, and then the adult. But flies, uh, flies are known because they only have two wings ever. Uh, the pine wings are reduced into these small knob-like structures called haltiers. You can actually see the haltiers here, and then the two pairs of wings, or the one pair of wings, and then one pair of wings there too. So this, this the daily little leaf miner is more like a kind of typical fly you think of, like a little tiny house fly. These are these black flies that land on your daily leaves. They'll puncture the leaves and feed on the sap and then lay an egg in there and that maggot will bore up and down in between in the, in the leaf surface, under the leaf surface. And so they mostly do aesthetic damage. They won't kill a plant, they won't cause anything to the flowers, but they leave these silver streaks up and down in the daily leaves. So that's what you're gonna be looking for. Finally, mites. The most important, I would say the most common pest in boxwood is a type of spider mite. So spider mites, how many of you all have dealt with spider mites before? Super common out there. So we're in the mites. So mites, what type of insect are they? They're not an insect. What's that? They're not an insect. Yes, they're not an insect. They're an arachnid. So they have eight legs. Well, we'll see. I'll show you in a minute. But uh, these spider mites, you can see the one, two, three, four legs on each side. Tiny, tiny uh, arthropods, they're arachnids. They're called spider mites because they produce a lot of silk. So we left this apple in the lab over the weekend and they completely encrusted it with silk. Uh, here's a male and female. But um, <coughs> two-spotted spider mite is very prolific, feeds on lots of different plants. But then the other species of spider mites feed on more specific than other plants. So boxwood spider mite causes these little yellow stippling patterns, these little tiny dots, almost looks like scratched on the surface of the leaf. Super common, very, one of the most common. You rarely ever see the actual mites because they're a cool season thing, but you will see the damage. So if you see that little stippling damage on boxwoods, you've got boxwood mite. Uh, there are also other types of mites. The flat mites are like, a, they're related to spider mites except when somebody stepped on them. Uh, and they just kind of crawl around and they feed on leaves like spider mites do. Then you get broad mites. Uh, so broad mites are a completely different group of mites. Very, very tiny. These are like a half a millimeter long or a quarter of a millimeter long. They're tiny, tiny. You couldn't see them except for with a really high-powered hand lens. These mites are really important because they cause distortions in the plants. They feed on the new growth and their saliva is toxic. It causes the plant to grow all distorted and really weird looking. Uh, so anybody want to tell me what plant that is? Hydrangea. It's a hydrangea. And you can see all those strap-like leaves. That's because it was infested with broad mites. Now, broad mites, if you have a scope of really high magnification, are very easy to identify. The females are football shaped with this kind of stripe in the back, but the eggs are what's really diagnostic. They have these really beautiful little, almost crystal ball eggs. They, they're all knobby and everything. They look like blown glass almost. And finally, one of my favorite groups of mites, this is one of my passions lately, is the areophyid mites. Uh, these mites only have four legs, all in the front, and the body is worm like. Now you will never see these because they are a quarter of a millimeter long and they look like dust to the naked eye. They're just tiny, tiny, tiny. But they, many of them produce galls. So if you ever see poison ivy, it's got little you know, pimples all over it. That's a whole bunch of these mites living inside there. Uh, all different plants, I can show you all different types and they're very species specific. Um, many of them are vagrants. They'll just crawl on the surface and feed on the plant. Some of them just don't cause any damage. They feed on the plant as well. But uh, they, and they can transmit viruses. So rose rosette virus is transmitted by one of these mites. And they're so small they get blown around with the wind and splash around. 
So finally, what uh, what plan is this? Um, yeah. Any, anybody other any other guesses? No, no. It's not either of those. That's a poplar. Have you ever seen a poplar leaf? No. Yeah, it doesn't look like that. So, like the other mites, like the broad mites, many of these mites also, their saliva causes distortion or galling, there's things like that. So these were all these tiny mites on the leaf surface. What about that plant? That's actually a tree. I'll give you that hint. It's a um, nissa, the uh, um, black gum, or, or tupelo. So these leaves should be nice and normal, but there's two species of these mites on tupelo or black gum. One creates these crinkly edges, and if you were to open them up, you'll find these little tiny mites living inside. The other species causes little wart-like warts all over the top. So if you ever see that with warts, also if you see black cherry, which grows everywhere, and you see these spindle-like, these red kind of wisps, or like, uh, like uh, almost like, looks like somebody, there's a wet leaf and somebody grabbed it and made it red and just pulled it out. If you cut that open, there's gonna be lots of these little mites in there too. So these are one of my favorite groups. They're really, really important, really interesting, and they look amazing under the scope, but You'll never get to see that, unfortunately, in the yard because they're just too tiny. So that's all I have for that. That's a lot of stuff, I know. Um, I, I'm happy to answer some more questions. We can talk. Um, I was going to show you one real quick, something after we talk, or after we're done. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have for right now. Okay.